Thank you so much for, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak in your seminar. As I mentioned, one of my co-authors, Alex Kloninger, also gave a seminar, I think, in this, in this venue some time ago. So you can think of this as an extension of the research that we did whatever, one or two years ago. Uh, anyway, so I will talk about manifold learning for point cloud data. So this is related to all of the research areas I work in. Uh, point cloud data in the sense of um, optimal transport, manifold learning in the sense of finding low dimensional structures. And then I will show how this can be used in certain applications in biology. I will mostly focus on one application, but you may or may not know. So if you don't know, you can, uh, I would be happy to talk more about this, or you can Google it. There's a lot of applications of optimal transport and point cloud um, problems in biological questions, especially when you deal with cell data and things like that. Okay, so let me quickly mention, so this is joint work with Alex, who I already mentioned, and there's Keaton Ham, who is in um, UT Arlington, uh, Varun Korana, who is a graduate student in UC San Diego, graduating next year, which is exciting, and then also Xiying Li, who, with whom I work right now, so the work I will present today is not exactly what we're working on, but it's very much related, and we will be extending it. Uh, I just want to mention she's a postdoc currently on the job market and very strong mathematician, so just mentioning that. Uh, also because it's going on YouTube, so everybody knows now. Uh, anyway, so this is the outline of my talk. Um, I will start with talking about what it means to do classification classification tasks on data points that are not really thought of regular vectors as we usually think about them but more as point clouds or actual distributions or measures and then once we are in this measure setup one natural way to go beyond that is optimal transport or a natural way to deal with this problem let's say like this is optimal transport. And I will talk about a version of optimal transport, which is called linearized optimal transport that I have used in the past. And it's, you know, it has shown very um, promising results. Um, and then I will have two parts. One is theory and one is experiments, where experiments really means like toy examples plus one actual application in biology. Okay, so I want to start with a very general slide that just talks about um, the fact that sometimes in life we want to deal with data sets that are not of the form very long vector in Rn, but more of a different type. And in this case, I want to talk about something that is either a histogram or a distribution um, or a measure. So, for example, so these are three things um, that, you know, three general applications in that sense. Uh, for example, the bag of word problem, this is the very left picture. It's basically a summary of text documents where you count how often each word appears and then you make a histogram out of that, right? So each document is represented by a histogram of word counts. Um, so this is a, a case where you don't think as a vector, but you more think of a histogram. Another um, application I'm interested in, and I will talk about this later, is gene expression data, um, which means that for given whatever a certain patient you, for every gene that you measure you have a certain expression level so the, a way to think about this is the expression level is a function over a node that represents the gene and the node is part of a graph that is rep that represents a gene network so something like we have two different genes they are connected by an edge if one gene activates the other and then the gene expression data is a function over the nodes. So the more expressed it is, you have more value, and the less expressed, you have less value. And if you normalize this function, you can think of gene expression data as a distribution over a, a gene network. Uh, OK. And then the last um, example I want to talk about is images. There are many ways to deal with images, right? But one way to think about it is basically a density over the pixel grid, right? So you have a pixel grid. On every pixel, you uh, give a value depending on how intense the image is on, on, on that pixel grid, right? So it can be thought of as a function over the pixel grid, which when you normalize it is a density. Um, of course, all of these things could also be represented as vectors, right? So you could think of the gene expression data as just a very long vector. The point here is that 
by viewing it as something like a distribution or a histogram, maybe not a histogram, as a distribution, you can also incorporate this geometric structure, which is the underlying gene network. And for the pixel grid, instead of thinking of the image as a very long vector, you can also incorporate the fact that you're actually thinking of the image over a pixel grid. And this will become useful later. So somehow it is a combination of thinking it of as whatever function values, but also thinking about the geometry that underlies the problem. You will hear more about this later, I'm just saying. This is, this is the benefit somehow. Okay, so the way I want to think about this data or these problems is by saying each instance of data is in the most general setting a measure. Or when you do applications, you might think of it as samples from the measure. So for example, if you do one dimensions, you can think of a histogram, right? And you know, a measure can be represented by a density. So density and measure is somehow, as long as you're absolutely continuous. I hope this makes sense. So, so either you think of it as a measure or you think of it as a density. Uh, okay, so this is the kind of data I want to talk about. And then the space in which this data lives is not Rn, but is something, I mean, it could be many things. In general, it's just a space of probability distributions. Um, but we want to think of it as a, an instance of data in the Wasserstein space, which to some extent is a natural way to think about this data. When I introduce optimal transport later, you will see how, um, how this is a very natural way to think about this. Um, but we have a certain type of data and we think of a space in which it lives and the Wasserstein space is one way to think about this. And I will introduce later what exactly that is, in case you haven't heard. Okay, so now we are in this model space with this very general type of data, and we want to do the same things that we can do in the linear space, right? So we want to do something which is classification, which is machine learning, right? So you have gene expression data from patients which are healthy and gene expression data from patients which have some kind of cancer, for example, and you want to classify that. And so today I will mostly talk about unsupervised ideas, meaning you only have the data, you don't have labels, and you're just trying to infer labels based on structure that underlies the data. And so for example, if you want to do unsupervised learning between such things, such data instances, for example, you want to do k-means, right? One thing you need is a distance between the objects. So if you have, um, to gene expression data, you want to say, are they close or are they far apart? If they are close, they go into the same bucket, and if they are far apart, they will be separated. So in order to do most unsupervised learning algorithms, you need some kind of notion of distance. And in our case, this is going to be the Wasserstein 2 distance. And the other thing I, I want to talk about is, rather than just doing classification algorithms, this problem of trying to uncover low dimensional structures. So here I have a, you know, a visualization that should, should somehow um, you know, give you an idea of what I mean. So you have this big blue space, which is the space of all measures. But really the data we're looking at is just this very thin line. It's a sub-manifold in some sense. So just having access to the samples on that submanifold in potentially very high dimensional space, so we cannot visualize it, right? Is there a way to figure out that this in fact is just a line? So either just a dimension or just an embedding space. And this is a classical problem in a field called manifold learning, right? So you're trying to uncover a low dimensional structure which lives in high dimensional space by some kind of embedding. And there exists a lot of algorithms that do that. So the question somehow is, if we happen to be in the Wasserstein space and we happen to look for a low dimensional structure of our data in that Wasserstein space, can we still do manifold learning? And the intrinsic, the, the intrinsic, the problem here is the infinite dimensionality of the space. If it was a finite dimensional space, we could just do regular was, um, manifold learning. But here we're really thinking of this as a, the Wasserstein space being infinite dimensional and problems appear with that. Anyways, we still have nice structure, so we can say something about that. I will talk about this. Um, okay, so the basic idea is we have a specific type of data. We have a new model space. We want to do the same things as we usually do, which is classification. 
and I will focus on unsupervised learning, but I want to mention that with the framework I, have, I will present, you can also do supervised learning, but it's not the topic of the talk today. Okay, and also if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I don't have to go through all 24 slides. We can also stop in between. So like, depending on you know how much you want to hear. Okay, so this is the introduction. Um, I want to make a few comments about what is going to happen. So before I introduce the actual thing, uh, to give you an intuition of what we're doing. So here we have the set mu i. So these are samples of this line I showed you on the last slide. So assume we have access to that. The results I'm going to present to you are of the following type. Assume we have these samples. If the samples are simple enough in some sense, then doing linear methods in a tangent space will basically be good enough for, our, for the purpose of what we want to do. So by this, I mean the following. You think about um, Romanian geometry, you have a sphere, you have data points on the sphere. You pick one of those data points, put a tangent plane in the data point and move all of the data points into the tangent space. So by move, I mean, logarithmic map, right? So we're going back into the tangent space. Not always well defined, but if we are close enough, we can do it. And then we are in this linear space and we choose to linear methods. And as you can imagine, this is probably going to work well if all of my samples are close enough to this tangent space and it's not going to work well when I'm far away. And we get a similar result for manifold learning in the Wasserstein or for samples from the Wasserstein space. So what I'm saying is, if we have simple data, we can do simple things, like linear algorithms. Okay, so here's more, more outline for that. So we're going to consider data that has been created by a specific process. Um, something like a generative model kind of idea. So you have one instance of your data, let's say one measure, mu. And then you, you apply simple functions to that measure. So this, this sharp um, symbol means push. So something like you have a sphere or a sphere. You have a Gaussian. I'm already thinking about geometry. You have a Gaussian, which is you know, samples from measure. And you just shift the Gaussian. Then you have, you have pushed the Gaussian with a translation, right? So whenever you have a function on the ground space, you can just move the whole thing with that function. Just think about the, the points, the point cloud, the samples, and just apply the function to all of the samples, they will move. Okay, so if our set, this line, has been created in a simple setting, in the sense that we pick one Gaussian, and then we apply simple functions to it. So we shift it around, we scale the Gaussian, we shear the Gaussian. Then, the thing I just mentioned before with the tangent space works very well. So when the functions are simple, the algorithm will be simple. This is somehow the, the summary. And this is what I will show you mathematically and you know, with a theorem. Uh, okay, so the strategy is the following. We pick a reference point, which is one of our samples, for example. We put the tangents plane into that point we move everything to the tangent plane and we use linear methods and we show an approximation result that says, if I use the linear distance, it is approximately the nonlinear distance as long as I'm close enough. So it's like with Riemannian geometry. And you might say something like, you know, tangent space and all of these things. They are, these things can be defined for the Wasserstein space, even though it's infinite dimensional. So there are concepts like in Romanian geometry um, for that particular model space. And this is why all of that works. So can I ask a question here, just clarify something? Sure. <clears throat> so in, in your assumption, you have the P, that is uh, like where you sample this mu i from or, or some domain set or, or image set because you apply this H sharp to, to mu, right? Yes, yeah, so mu means one measure, a fixed measure. So for example, you can think of it as an image, right? So 
you take one image and then right. h is a function in l2 that you apply to your image right so basically you take this image and then whatever it's the image of a seven and then you take the seven and you move it around the grid with functions h and this creates a big set of images so p you can think of as a set of measures a set of images then what, what, what does a sharp mean it, is that h or Oh, you mean what so the sharp you, means? You say H is L2, right? Then what is L sh H sharp? Right. So if you have a function on the ground space, so H goes from R2 to R2, for example, right? Right. Then you can induce a function on the space of measures, which is the sharp notation. So whenever you have a fun function in the ground space, you can get out of it a function in the space of measures, which are supported on that space. And basically the way you should think about it is, you have a Gaussian that consists of a lot of samples. We mm -hmm. just apply the function H to all of the samples. Okay. This is basically what it means. It's just a notation of saying you have a function in the ground space. It will create a function on the, on the space of measures. Oh, I see. And I this see. is the notation okay. for it. Okay. And then your data set is from this P, right? Yes. So my data set, the thing, the data set I'm thinking about is P which you can think of as a collection of images of seven where seven has been moved around. Mm. And see. then in this big blue picture, the P is just the line. And yeah, yes, yes. the blue yeah. thing is all the pictures that exist. Mm. And we're just looking to find the line of images of sevens. Oh, I see. This is somehow the idea. Oh, that, yeah, thanks. Mm. Okay, thanks for the question. Yeah, so there's a lot of notation which I have not introduced um, because I'm trying to, at this point, I'm trying to give you an idea. I hope the idea is clear. <laughs> okay, so let me talk a little bit about this optimal transport thing in case you haven't heard about it. Um, so whenever you deal with uh, measures or distributions, optimal transport gives you a natural way to, intro to introduce a distance and to do other things as well, geometric things. Um, so this is the basic um, introduction to optimal transport that says, let's say you have two measures, mu and nu. In this case, they are one dimensional in the sense that they are supported on the line, right? Before, when I talked about images, it's two dimensional. This is just for visualization purposes, it's easier. And the optimal transport problem says something like this. We want to find the distance between mu and nu. So how similar are those two objects? Here, nu is below the x-axis to explain the original problem, but in fact, it will be above the x-axis because it's, it has to be positive, right? So this is just for visualization. Okay, so how similar are mu and nu? And then the, the original idea from Monge was the following. You think of mu as a pile of sand and we think of nu as a whole. And we will try to figure out what is the minimal amount of work I need to do to move this sand into the hole? This is the basic idea. And what does it mean to do work to move sand? It means I have to walk on, on my axis, right? So this is the one thing. So if the two, if mu and nu are far away, it will be more work because I have to walk with the sand, right? So the, the local distance, the underlying distance makes a difference. And the other thing about work is the amount of sand I have to carry, right? So it's basically two objects, how much I have to walk and how much I have to carry. And I want to do it in the best way possible, right? Because it's work. So best way meaning I'm not going to take sand and run in circles and then go to new, but I'm going, I take the sand and I go directly to new and I place it in the best way possible so that when I come back and do it again, I will not have to walk extra, right? So this is somehow the idea. Uh, in the end, it's an optimization problem. So maybe let me just write down the problem. Let's look at the um, smooth problem before. Basically, we're looking for a map that tells me how much sand in mu, uh, in, in mu do I have to move into nu. So we're looking for a T that, again, the sharp notation pushes the measure mu into nu such that it minimizes the overall cost that I have to do. And the cost is this integration. It basically means, so you have the t, t of x minus x means 
the displacement, how much I have to walk. This is the distance on the x-axis. And then I multiplied with d mu, which is the infinitesimal amount of sand I have to carry, integrate over the entire space. So we're looking for the best map that minimizes this cost. This is basically the optimal transport definition. And I get two things out of that. One is this map T, which does the minimal job, and basically taking the L2 norm of T minus identity, I get the Wasserstein distance. So this is the, a distance between mu and mu. So basically a distance is how much does it cost to move mu into mu. And what you can imagine is if I have mu and mu like this, and I move them apart, I will have more cost. So the distance will be larger. If the, I move them closer together, it will be less cost. So the underlying um, distance, in this case, it is the Euclidean distance, makes a difference in my Wasserstein problem. And this relates back to what I was saying before with the images. If we think of the image as something on a pixel grid, it is different than thinking of them just as a vector. Because on the pixel grid, the location of where the seven is makes a difference. And this is what goes into the optimal transform. Okay, so this is the smooth description of optimal transport. In case you haven't seen it, it might be a little bit, uh, might look complicated, but the idea is basically cost minimization. Um, on the right hand side, you see an image of um, the discrete problem. Right? So instead of thinking of smooth distributions, we're thinking of points sampled from those. And then the optimal transport problem becomes an optimal assignment problem. So we're looking for a T that optimally assigns each red point to a blue point. And optimal means the distance, right? So I'm not going to match the top red point to the bottom blue point, because this is more way to walk. I'm going to match it across on the same height, so I have to walk less. So distance really means in the R2 space. Okay, and also, yeah, so these are the figures, the, the citations below is where the figures come from. Uh, I have to make a couple of uh, no, uh, mention, uh, comments here. One is, uh, okay, so we get this Wasserstein distance, W2. We get a map the optimal transport map. And this problem might not have a solution if we don't impose some assumptions. So um, for example, and if you think about a discrete problem, the size of the circle means how much mass is in the circle. So if you think maybe what at this in this figure, all of them have the same amount of mass, right? So it does make a difference. But if one of them has more mass than the others, I cannot I assign it to just one of the blue points because it has too much mass. I have to move all of it. So what I would want to do is I would want to split the mass. And this formulation does not allow for that because we're looking for a map and a map can only move one point to another. I cannot say here's this amount of mass, let's split it because then it goes to two points. So this framework is a little bit restrictive. But if my measures have some regularity, I will actually get a unique optimal transport map. Uh, by the way, this is what I was just mentioning before. So if you have one point with more mass, you want to split it. And then you have to, you cannot use the, the, tra the transport map notation I just introduced, but you have to do something which is called the Kantorovich relaxation, which allows to do mass splitting. And instead of maps, you're finding couplings. But I will today mostly focus on the mapping um, the case where they exist, when there exists a map. Um, and we'll not talk about the Kantorovich relaxation, even though this is usually what is used in whenever, when you run code or when you do something, because it's, it always exists. Just wanted to mention it. If you come across it, this is usually what people do. But for today, we will assume, given two measures, there is an optimal transport map. Okay, so I hope this makes some sense. Um, so what we get out of this is a way to compare two measures. So if you think of images, you can compare images with the L1 distance, right? You can, whatever distance. This is another way to compare two images by just thinking of them as distributions and then doing Wasserstein distance. 
So it's a way to compare things that takes into account the geometry of the space on which the distribution is supported by using, in this case, the Euclidean distance. But what you can imagine, instead of the Euclidean distance, I can also use a different distance, right? So for example, let's think of a sphere and the measure supported on the sphere. Then instead of the Euclidean distance on the sphere, I would use the shortest path distance on the sphere, right? So it doesn't have to be Euclidean. It's flexible in that sense. Okay, um, some comments. First of all, the W2, um, I wrote metric, but what I mean is it's a distance. It's actually a distance on the space of probability densities. And there's books about that. So there's a very well-known theory. And um, there's a lot of geometric knowledge of that space. For example, tangent spaces, exponential map, logarithmic map. We can use all of these things, which is, which is nice. Uh, we can also do interpolation. Um, the problem somehow for applications, in particular if you want to do biology and you have a set of whatever, 80,000 cells, um, is the computation. So finding this optimal transport map, if exists, is uh, a linear program that scales cubic in the amount of um, points you have. So this can be a problem if you want to do large computations and if, and if you want to do many of those, right? So there's a way to go around this. I'm just mentioning this in case you, you're thinking about applying, doing optimal transport and haven't done it before. So there's an approximation to the actual optimal transport distance, which is called synchron distance. And it basically uses a regularizer to speed up the computation. So you go from cube to squared. Um, still, so the, the one thing I want to mention about this computation issue, there are mainly, mainly two things that are important. One is how many samples do I have from my measure? So how big is my point cloud? This is, let's say, little n. And if I want to compare two point clouds, it is important to have an algorithm that is fast in the little n. Right? So right now, if I did a linear program, it would be n cubed log n, something like that. However, if you want to do many point clouds and compare all of them pairwise, the amount of point clouds that you have will also play a role, right? Because you have to do more pairwise comparisons. So there's somehow two computational bottlenecks. Either you have very big point clouds or you have many point clouds, or usually you have many big point clouds and then you have two bottlenecks somehow. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so let me just mention maybe the learning part. So we have a distance. Right? So doing unsupervised learning in theory is possible if you forget about the computation, because we just take whatever K means and we use the Wasserstein distance and you know, it's reasonable. There's a way to do that. If we wanted to do supervised learning, we would need something like an embedding space. And I mean, this talk is not about supervised learning. I just want to mention this as we go. And the thing I'm going to introduce next, which is this tangent space approximation idea, um, also allows for supervised learning. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. Do any questions on Wasserstein distance? Yeah, yeah. So here, uh, you say that unsupervised. Uh, you really mean you want to like a clustering things, right? So when I say unsupervised, I mean something like clustering, right? Okay. And you mentioned that like the computation, you, you form like the linear programming. Mm -hmm. It's not really maybe a sign, right? It's maybe already did some relaxation, right? Because if you do assignment, maybe you have this point at that point, right? Mm -hmm. It's like zero or one, right? Uh, well, I mean, you have many choices of points. It's not just two points. So you have yeah. the original red point, uh -huh. and you have to decide to which blue point to match it. And you have to okay. decide for all red points simultaneously what is the best matching, mm -hmm. right? So if you if you did all of the computations, so every possible pairing, which is not how this works, right? But this would be the naive idea. Um, this would be a huge computation. Okay, but you don't really have like a zero or one constraint. 
it's uh, it's like a, because you map like the, this measure to another measure it, somehow you you have the total mass equals the, the total mass of, of oh you're right yeah, yeah yeah sorry yes so there is a, a constraint that says maybe let me go back um it's here it's written t push mu is equal to mu basically mm -hmm. saying the mass in mu uh, sorry the mass in mu has to be all of it has to be distributed to mu Right, right, and right, right. all of new has to be um, covered by mass of new. This okay. is yeah, that, something that's is called the balance problem. So if yes, you look yes. at the discrete thing, it basically means every point has to be mm -hmm. matched. Right, 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 right. While you can also do something which is unbalanced optimal transport mm -hmm. where, you, where the constraint is, let, is relaxed. But right now I'm really talking about the case you have this linear program with constraints. I see. <clears throat> yeah, very good point. Uh, I didn't, maybe, yes. So there's a discrete formulation which makes the linear program part more obvious than the smooth yeah. one. Okay, so I think up to now, the only thing you have to know is we look at measures or point clouds, if you prefer, and we have a distance between them, which is natural. This is all we have. And now, um, with that, we can do unsupervised learning. Now I want to talk about this tangent space idea, which allows to do supervised learning as well, and which will help us with uh, manifold learning, at least computationally. Okay, so this is called linear optimal transport, um, which will make sense in a second. Um, linear in the sense of linearized, right? So this is this tangent space idea. You have a point, which in our case is a measure, and you move it into the tangent space in another point, therefore linearized. Uh, it turns out the tangent space is contained in the L2 functions. So this is a result from you know, people who actually do geometry and the same space. Uh, and the way this going from the manifold to the tangent space works is you have a measure mu, you choose a reference sigma, and the tangent vector is basically the optimal transport map that goes from sigma to mu. So tangents vectors are L2 functions. So what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm identifying my mu by the tangent vector, with the tangent vector that starts in sigma and goes to mu. This is what this map means. So basically identifying a measure with a map. And as you can see, this becomes a linear problem, right? Because we're going into the L2 function space. And geometrically, it means we go into the tangent space. The other thing you might see about this is the following. Let's say we have two measures that are very similar. And we compute for both of them the optimal transport map to a fixed other measure, so something like that. Um, if the two measures are similar, the optimal transport to a fixed, uh, sorry, if the two measures are similar, the optimal transport to a fixed third measure will also be similar because they have to, the optimal transport has to opti optimally match sigma to the, the two mu's. So if the mu's are similar, the maps should somehow be similar. Otherwise, you know, the measures would be different. Um, therefore, there is some kind of relation between those things, right? It, it somehow makes sense that we can use the map as a feature of the actual measure. Okay, let me, before I talk about this, let me just show you this plot. I think this explains what we're doing. Um, so you choose sigma, you put the tangent plane into sigma, it's a subspace of L2. You have two points on the actual manifold, nu and mu, and then we identify them with this to those two straight black lines, which are the tangent vectors. And in fact, these are the, the optimal transport maps. So the tangent vectors become L2 functions. Okay, and then we can define a new distance in the tangent space, which is just a linear distance. Right, so take the two measures, move into the tangent space, and the distance between the two measures is the Euclidean, Euclidean, the L2 distance between the two tangent vectors. And obviously, the question becomes, is this linearized distance in some way related to the original Wasserstein distance? And we call it W2 LOT. And well, <laughs> again, as you can imagine, if the two points are very close to the sigma, the linear distance should also be reasonably close. 
to the actual distance. It's like in Riemannian geometry. The closer you are to the tangent space, the better the linear approximation is. It's similar here. However, if the two points are very far away, the approximation will get worse. So this thing, oh, this is about learning. This thing brings the, uh, the, the question of, is the linearized distance connected to the Wasserstein distance? And if yes, how close are they? It will depend on how far measures are away. But we will also find a certain subset for which this is for which the two things are always the same. This is the interesting subset. Um, okay. I'm introducing this distance because it's um, it's useful to make computations faster. This is not visible right now because right now I'm just comparing two measures, right? <laughs> and the bottleneck is finding the optimal transport net. Here, I still need to find the optimal transport net. But the point is, if you have to compare do pairwise distances between many measures, it's obviously much faster doing that because you only have to compute optimal transport of all of these measures to a fixed reference. So instead of doing all pairwise distances, you once go to the reference and then you approximate the distance between two as the distance of the the two optimal transport nets in between. So you just, instead of n, n cubed, uh, n squared, in the number of measures, you only have n. This is the point. So whenever this is a good approximation, we can save a lot of computations on the number of point clouds that we're comparing. OK. I hope this makes sense. And I just wrote one line about learning, so learning in the sense of supervised. Uh, once we have this tangent space, we can move all of our measures into the tangent space with this idea and then just apply a linear classification algorithm in the tangent space. Obviously, the question is, will it work or not? Uh, I will not go into that, but basically what I'm telling you is whenever your measures are nice, it will work very well. And if they are close to nice, it will work close to nice. <laughs> so something like that. <laughs> So there is, we can prove something about it. So you can do supervised learning. So this is, I have a question here. Yeah. So, so, so you say that you can reduce like the computation complexity from maybe n squared to n, right? Mm -hmm. So that is because if you already have this T sigma mu things, right? Mm -hmm. You have this uh, uh, map from mu to the T. Then this W2 lot distance will be easy to compute or? Uh, it's it's not easy. It's just in total, it's less computations. So let's say we want we you have big n point clouds. Yes. And you want to find all W two lot distances. What you need to compute is the optimal transport from the reference. Yeah. Sigma to all of those. Right, right, right. That's n. That's n optimal expensive optimal transport computations. Right. And then you put it into the linear distance, which is cheap. Yeah, that's what I mean. So like uh, this distance, W2 lot, that will be relatively cheaper right. to compute than this W2 distance. Right. I mean, you still have to compute the optimal transport map, which is... Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But it's n instead of n squared. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. it's an it's a n optimal transport plus the n squared to this new distance. Right. I see. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's the benefit. <laughs> Got it. So the point is, it's it's easy to compute that, and we can use it if it approximates the Wasserstein distance well. If it doesn't approximate it well, we do we're doing something different than what I just described with Wasserstein distances. So the question becomes, when is this a good approximation? And this is somehow what we were what we were studying. Um, okay, um, this is just a quick note on this thing I talked about in the beginning. Whenever the functions are, whenever the underlying data points, data points, measures are nice and simple, this will work very well. And then I said this thing about shifts and scalings and shearings. So whenever you have an image of a seven and all of the other data points are also images of the seven, just being shifted around or scaled, computing the linearized distance between those is actually exactly the Wasserstein distance. 
So for simple cases, shifted, scaled, and sheared version of one specific thing, we will get exactly the Wasserstein distance. The reason is that for these, in these cases, um, the, the exponential map in the Wasserstein sense is invertible. So you can go forth and back between the, between the tension space. So what I'm telling you is there is a nice um, sub-manifold in our Wasserstein space, which is created by these shifts and scalings for which the linear distance is the nonlinear distance. So it's basically a flat manifold. And for this one, we can make a lot of nice statements. Okay. So for the theory results, maybe let me mention one of them. And I think I will skip the other one because it's just a lot of um, approximation theory results. And let me just mention this quickly, uh, which talks about this idea of doing, um, of taking a template, a seven, and then applying a function G and a function H. G and H are both shifts and scalings or shearings. And if we compute the linearized distance between two such images and the Wasserstein distance between two such images, we basically get a bound on how close they are. If we use exactly shifts and scalings, the right-hand side will be zero. So the, the epsilon basically tells you how much am how far am I away from being a perfect shift or scaling? So let's say you you're doing a shift of a seven, and then there's some perturbation. That's the epsilon. If you have no perturbation, the linearized distance will be the Wasserstein distance. If you have a little bit of perturbation, the approximation between the two of them is of the order epsilon one half. This is basically what the result says, and it follows um, from Hölder type regularity results, which we take from other people's work. And whenever the bounds on these Hölder results improve, our bounds improves as well. And this result comes with a lot of regularity assumptions, which you can drop if you make the bound a little bit weaker. So this is basically the result. Whenever you want a tighter bound, you need more regularity. When you're more flexible with the bound, and you can get, you don't need all of the regularity. So this basically tells us if I am on my optimal, optimal is the wrong word because we're using it for other things as well, on my perfect little circle, if, if I'm on the sub-manifold in the blue space, and the sub-manifold has been created by shifts and scalings and shearings, or I am in a tube around that with epsilon, then using linearized distances is actually okay because I can control the error. Um, if I'm away from my perfect submanifold, I have no idea. So <laughs> just to match that. Okay, so this is an approximation result. I, we talked about the computational improvement. Um, I think I will skip the next thing. I just want to mention, instead of doing smooth measures, we can also deal with samples of those measures and do the same process of linearization. So an integration becomes a sum. This is what it's written here. So it's an empirical linearized distance. And we can derive bounds for that as well, which is maybe more applicable in uh, you know, actual problems, because usually we're not dealing with smooth things, but we're dealing with um, samples drawn from smooth things. And so maybe I would just say there is a bound, but not going too much, too, too much detail about it, uh, because I think the applications is actually the more interesting thing. Okay, so this goes more into the application. So we talked about distances, we talked about unsupervised learning, which can be done with the distances. And what I think I have just hopefully convinced you with um, is if I want to do unsupervised learning with the linearized distance and I'm close to this nice, nice little manifold, it's okay. If I'm far away, we don't know. This slide or line of research talks about actually uncovering the circle on the blue manifold. So let's say you have, you know, the, the manifold of all images. Or, okay, let me say it differently. You have the manifold, you have the space of all measures. 
And in that space of all measures sits our uh, one dimensional circle that has been created in a nice way. Um, how can I figure out that this thing is really just a one dimensional thing? And can I find an embedding for that? This is what I will talk about now. Um, and we, we do this problem with an algorithm, which is called multi-dimensional scaling algorithm. So many code learning has a lot of different algorithms, right? Um, this is our first attempt towards this problem. And multi-dimensional scaling is basically an algorithm that visualizes distances. So you give it a distance matrix and it makes you an embedding plot that with points where the points are chosen in such a way that the, the distances of the distance matrix are kept. This is basically the algorithm. Um, okay, so we want to apply this for our circle. So what we're doing is, first idea, compute all, all pairwise distances, Wasserstein distances, throw it into MDS, multidimensional scaling, and look at the embedding plot, right? Um, so this is basically the idea. Somehow a problem is the Wasserstein computation, but it doesn't matter um, for the moment. This is a very general result telling us under which circumstances we can actually uncover this line. Um, so the result says the following. Assume you have data points, in this case measures, in the Wasserstein space. So they lie either on this circle, which is the W, or they lie tau one close to it. So there's a tube around this W circle. And we assume that this thing, so the circle should not be closed, otherwise it's wrong. Uh, we assume that this thing is isometric to something which is flat, right? So if you think of, think of a bended but open circle, it will be isometric to a line, right? Okay, so the W is the bended thing in the Wasserstein space and the omega is the straight line. And we want to figure out that our bended W, which lies in a very high dimensional Wasserstein space and we have no idea what it looks like, we want to find an embedding such that we can visualize the omega, which is the parameter set. Okay, so assume we are in this bended thing or around the bended thing, tau one is how far we are away from this. And in, we, we compute pairwise Wasserstein distances. We get the distance matrix, right? However, instead of doing the actual Wasserstein distances, we do something else, like linearized Wasserstein, like the synchron distance, like a combination of those. So an approximation to the Wasserstein distance, because it's hard to compute the Wasserstein distance for all of those computations. So let's say instead of computing all pairwise distances, we compute lambdas, which are almost the Wasserstein distance, tau two. So for the slide I showed you before, the tau two would be epsilon one half, right? And the other slide I showed you before, the tau two would be the very long thing I had for the samples. If we put the lambda matrix into MDS, the multidimensional scaling, so instead of the actual distance matrix, we put in the approximation, the lambda, we will get embedding points which represent omega up to the error we started with, namely the error tau one, how close am I to the manifold, and the error tau two, how good am I with my approximation. So what I'm telling you is, if you are, let's forget about the approximation, let's say you are perfectly on this open circle in the Wasserstein space, and you compute pairwise Wasserstein distances exactly, MDS will uncover a straight line for you. So it will tell you this is a line, it is a one dimension space. This result that I just mentioned without approximation is something which is called the WASMAP algorithm, which is mentioned at the bottom. However, if I am not exactly on my open circle, but a, a, around it with tau one error, and I'm not doing exact distances, but I'm doing lambda distances, I will uncover the straight line up to an error tau one plus tau two and a constant. This is the approximation type result. So basically what we're saying is, you do experiments, you know they should be nice, but there is an error. How stable is this algorithm with respect to the error? 
and it basically collects the errors. So it's it's a nice thing in that sense. Okay. I will not talk too much about uh, other results. I just want to show you a couple of nice plots. Um, so forget about the formula at the top. This is a way to compute um, MDS faster if you want. So instead of doing pairwise distances, you can also just do optimal transport maps, um, vectorize them and put this into um, and compute SVD of that. This is a way to compute MDS, but this is computational details. Um, the point really is the footy plots below, which is toy examples. So for example, if you look at this rotation problem, um, we take a Gaussian, which is one of our measures, and then we rotate it around the circle, right? This is what you see in the top plot. And so our, each data point is one of those Gaussians. The important point about these Gaussians is not the fact that all of them are Gaussians, but the fact that they have been created from a circle, right? So the way one creates such a data set is choose the midpoints on the circle and then put the Gaussian on all of these midpoints. So the latent space is the circle, right? So if I do the thing I just described, pairwise distances between the Gaussians, in this case, we did linearize to be faster, do MDS embedding, I will exactly uncover the circle. So this is the middle plot of these three plots. So the true embedding points are the circle. The thing I uncover is the circle. So this thing actually works. And then we do, you know, other toy examples with translations, circular translations. We always uncover the actual underlying parameter space. Okay. Um, the nice thing is this. <laughs> Talks about the timing. Uh, the only reason uh, I talked about the linearized optimal transport is because we, if we replace the Wasserstein distance with the linearized one, we can be much faster in pairwise computations. And this is what you see here. So the, all of these embedding plots were done with the linearized distance. And this, these two plots are basically the timing. So the red thing is doing the full Wasserstein distance and the purple and blue ones is when you do linearized distance with either the linear program or the synchronous. algorithm. So it's, it's much faster as the sample size increases. And it's not flat. So this is the, bot, the plot at the bottom. It does go up, but it doesn't go up as fast as the Wasserstein distance does. OK, so this is, I think, the main thing I want to say about um, what we did on manifold learning. There's much more to do, because the thing I just mentioned is basically flat. Um, but let's not get into this. I want to mention one last thing and then I'm done, um, which is an action application. And the application is basically this. The gene network I showed you, gene expression data from different patients on the gene network. Everybody has the same gene network, but people have different gene expression data. So basically what we're doing is comparing gene expression data by doing optimal transport between the two gene expression distributions with the ground space being the gene network. So this is what we're doing. So you should think of this as the gene network. You have 50 patients, for example, or it's, it's much more, but let's say it's 50. You have 50 of those networks. Each network has a different function over the network, which is the gene expression data. And then we do pairwise distances to compare this gene expression data over the network. Pairwise Wasserstein distances. And then we take the major Wasserstein distance matrix and we put it into a clustering, for example, and see what happens. And oh, sorry, this is one too much. This is a this is an embedding plot. It's not MDS, it's what diffusion maps, but you can think of it as a dimension reduction. And basically what we find is that for some cases, so this was a specific type of cancer, um, the um, some, some cancer types cluster together, right? So you can see this with the red dots and the green dots, and uh, um, I think it's light yellow, something like that, uh, light red dots. So we, we do get some kind of clustering behavior. And then we find some other clusters which have different cancer types, which actually the thing which is interesting because somehow the gene expression is the same or similar, but it's different types of cancer. The question is, you know, why is that happening? 
uh, and this is joint work with um, many people from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center from 2019. So there's a citation over here. Anyway, I just wanted to mention this as a way to apply Wasserstein distance ideas to actual data sets. And we can do many things with that, right? So this is a dimension reduction plot. We can do clustering and we can say something interesting about um, the clustering behavior and the different clusters that appear. Okay, so I think with that, I will finish. The summary just says there's much to do. So if you're interested, let me know. And uh, here I have a, a couple of papers. Again, if you're interested, I can send you all of this so you don't have to take notes now. And yeah, thank you so much and happy to take more questions. Okay, thank you very much for the very, very nice uh, talk.